believe it. Joining us now to discuss is Steer PR partner Lauren Tomlinson and former Biden campaign Democratic strategist Kevin Walling. Guys, thank you so much for coming into the studio. Uh, first off, credit to Joe for digging up that video. Unbelievable. <laughs> A lot more where that came from, by the way. But does they that, were making videos every other day like this. But does that video play into what the Republicans are trying to say, that some of these banks were focused on and had different agendas? They weren't focused on core business, which is people's money. They were focused on things like TikTok videos. Yeah, right? Listen, as a communications professional, obviously those have an important, you know, part of a communications campaign. Like, right, you want to bring in your employees and have those types of things. Um, but I do think that it raises the question of, you know, what, how were they approaching uh, their really serious responsibility to, to uh, you know, to provide for their investors, to make sure that the deposits were there when it, they needed it. And, um, you know, I think a broader, I think the, the whole woke conversation is a little... Um, cute, uh, right? <laughs> for And it's easy for, I think, lay people and for Republicans to kind of make the case to plain language to their constituencies, what they're looking at. But I think what they're really saying is we've got to take a real look at some of these smaller banks. We've been focusing on the big banks, the too big to fail banks. They're heavily regulated. They have a lot of stress tests, all those things. What are the local feds doing? And how are they looking at some of these smaller banks who obviously, you know, carry a lot of weight in this economy right now? Kevin, we've been talking to a lot of lawmakers over the last couple of days. Monday, it was blame game. It was lack of regulation. No, lack of enforcement. No, the Fed. As we've made our way through the week, we've started hearing a lot less of that to the point where Democrats and Republicans on the program today are saying, hey, we need to figure out what happened first. What's, what's leading to this realization? Are they hearing things that we don't know about? Well, Joe, I think both parties have skin in the game with this, right, and are culpable to some degree in terms of some of this lax... Uh, regulation. You saw that great interview that you just had with Patrick McHenry, the chair of the Financial Services Committee, who repeated multiple times that it was a bipartisan bill in 2018 yeah. uh, with regards to banking oversight. So I think you see both parties have the skin in the game. It's a nice uh, way to get out of an answer, right? We still need time to <laughs> investigate what actually is happening mm -hmm. before any legislation is proposed or any kind of uh, 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 legislative action takes place. What happened with those 17 senators? that voted to ease in 2018. Do you think this is going to come back to haunt him? I think of those that are up for re-election, like Senator Manchin. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we'll see uh, what, uh, and again, to, to Lauren's point earlier, th these are complicated matters, right? So that it, Republicans use this woke kind of thing to, to capture all of their arguments under one notion. This is a really serious, complicated issue at hand that uh, you know, we'll see just 600 days from now what the appetite is with the American people if they're actually interested in this uh, issue 600 days from now. Sticking with the communications theme here, which is pretty important at the moment, uh, Lauren, we heard from Janet Yellen today testifying on Capitol Hill. We really only heard from Joe Biden before the market opened on Monday. What else, if anything, should the White House, should the administration be doing to shore up confidence? Yeah, I mean, they say that they have a plan, right, and that they've been executing on this plan. I think, again, like we've been saying, the plain language. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of this is, you know, they're they're looking at macro trends and they're trying to look at the economy as a whole and the, the trickle-down effect, right? But for the average American, they're like, oh, it sounded like a rich, like, tech bank and I don't really understand mm -hmm. what's going on and did this impact me or did this not? I don't care. You know, am I getting paid on Friday? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think they have a responsibility to really take these arguments down from a very academic economic perspective and really like plain language what does this mean for average people why are they doing this is it going to affect is the taxpayer bailing people out yeah. you know like that's like a real question because they're like well i don't want to pay more taxes i mean i just saw your budget plan that's kind of crazy so you know there's <laughs> a lot of things like that where i think that there's real um opportunities for messaging that they could take advantage of lauren and kevin stay with us again after the break coming up we're going to talk about this new released video of a russian fighter jet have you seen this colliding with an American drone and the geopolitical implications of that encounter with our panel? This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I'm Joe Matthew, along with Anne-Marie Hordern. Our panel, Lauren and Kevin, are still with us as we look at this new video. It was released earlier today. You might have seen it by the U.S. military of a Russian fighter jet, an Su-27, releasing fuel, a fuel dump right in front of an American drone, trying to down the thing into the Black Sea. It did cause it to crash, creating 
Further tension, of course, between the U.S. and Russia. Now, we know uh, that this is nothing new, these types of uh, intercepts when it comes to Russia. This goes back to the Cold War. This one actually damaged American hardware. And we have a story here on the terminal, actually. General Mark Milley is not calling this an act of war. Kevin, what should we call it? Uh, it's certainly an escalation of force, as we're seeing. And, and, Joe, it's a great point. We've seen this go on for the last 40 years over the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, but these interdictions are coming with more rapid speed uh, as these Russians now claim more and more of the international airspace, right, from, the, from Crimea into their special military incursion uh, into Ukraine. Uh, I think I'm actually heartened by this incident in that at least we're now back on the hotline to the Russians. Mm -hmm. We've not been speaking to them since October. Mm -hmm. uh, General Milley, uh, to your point in the question, had a phone conversation with his counterpart, same with General uh, Austin, uh, Secretary Austin. That is a positive sign to some degree that we're having those conversations, but it's certainly an escalation that needs to have some semblance of response from this administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shoigu and Austin getting on the phone. A lot of people think, okay, at least there's at least, a, at least there's yeah. there's communication. When you look at the politics of this, it's kind of fascinating how the Republicans. Because if I talked to say Senator McConnell, he'd look at this and he'd say, we actually should be harsher on on Russia. But then obviously you heard what Governor DeSantis had to say. How are they going to work around this messaging going into 2024? I think that you're going to see kind of a split in the party between the 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 isolationists, right, like the DeSantis and Trump, and then, you know, because I'm just going down the presidential field right now, right, like that gave statements to Tucker Carlson uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. So we have DeSantis um, and Trump that are, you know, more of the isolationist field, more of the why are we spending this money on Ukraine, right? That's their, their whole premise. Um, then you have Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, you know, a lot of the more mainstream, I guess, like Republicans or the hawkish Republicans um, who are saying that, you know, Ukraine Ukraine is a vital interest, right, that we have to stand up to Russian aggression because if we don't put our foot down here, what does that say to China? What does that say to Iran? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to have a trickle effect if the U.S. does not take a strong stance on the global stage. The two most likely candidates, though, the two most likely nominees, the Republican nomination. Right now. If you look at the right polls. Right now, absolutely. <laughs> Ron DeSantis calls it a border dispute. We know what Donald Trump says about it. But how could you say a border dispute watching thousands of civilians die over the last year here. I mean, uh, that's not a talking point that's going to resonate with the Republican establishment, is it? No, I don't think it is. And I don't think, it, more, most importantly, it's not going to resonate with the national security community. Um, and I think that's where he really loses people, because every man or woman with a uniform on knows how important it is for America to maintain a very strong stance on the global stage in defense of democracy and in defense of our allies. Um, and I think that's where actually he's going to lose a lot of people. And I think that there is a real conversation to be had about the U.S. spending, right? This is kind of where it's all going back to, um, that how much money are we giving to our allies? How much money are we spending abroad? How much money are we spending on defense? But those conversations, that debate, that needs to be happening in our Congress with, mm -hmm. you know, over budget issues, right? It doesn't need to be happening over our debt ceiling, and it mm -hmm. doesn't need to be happening over the Ukrainian war. Bringing up this video again, it's a Russian fighter jet colliding with a U.S. surveillance drone. I mean, I mean, the U.S. releasing this politically also potentially is useful. Does this not just say to the DeSantis's who think this is a territorial dispute, well, actually, no, what Russia is doing is reckless on U.S. military hardware. It's a really good point, Anne-Marie. And I think you're seeing this administration do more of that in terms of releasing this classified material so uh, early uh, in the process. We saw it with Ukraine. We saw it even with uh, issues with uh, China and, and Taiwan. So this administration has made this calculation to put that information out there because it totally debunks uh, the Russian uh, statements that are out there about this incident. Um, yeah, Russia says it never happened. Exactly. And you now have the proof, uh, the multiple videos of this uh, plane not just dropping that fuel, but also colliding with one of the propellers. Um, but I think to your original point, Emory, that you see this divide within the Republican Party. You have 50 percent of registered Republicans that now question uh, not just our uh, support of the Ukraine uh, people, but also the timelines, uh, uh, budgeting, things like that. Um, and you see that divide play out. And the parties have almost flipped on this, right? Where would Ronald Reagan be right now <laughs> if he were alive, right? He would be with Joe Biden and not a Ron DeSantis. It's true. All right, our thanks to our panel, Steer PR partner Lauren Tomlinson and former Biden campaign Democratic strategist Kevin Walling. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter. All these stories will be on there on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us. Coming up tomorrow, we'll be speaking with Representative Debbie Dingell 
of Michigan. This is Bloomberg. We'll see you then.